1 Timothy 6, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith, <clears throat> lay hold on eternal life. And that's really what we talked about last week. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, this command to you know fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. He says, I charge you, verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this amazing passage. And Lord, as so many times we say, Lord, we're not going to even begin to do this justice tonight. We pray you'd help us. And Lord, we pray that you would be pleased. We pray that you would speak. And uh, Lord, make it a living thing to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. It says in verse 14, he charges Timothy, he says, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Until the appearing. And man, the Bible talks about that a lot. Um, I don't know if you've ever looked at the word appear or appearing, but it is, uh, it's a pretty interesting word. Um, of course, appear just simply means to come into sight, to be visible, to become visible to the eye. If something appears, it's a, you might have been thinking about it. You might have had a, you might have had a visual in your brain. You might have even had a picture, but all of a sudden, when it appears, it's you see it with your eye. Look at a couple places with me. Again, keep your place in First Timothy six, but go to Mark sixteen with me. Mark sixteen, Matthew, Mark, second book in the New Testament, Mark sixteen. He said, Timothy, he said, I want you to lay hold on eternal life. And he said, I want you to keep this commandment until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word appear. Look at uh, Mark 16. And of course, this is one of those chapters that talks about our Lord's resurrection. And um, look at Mark 16, verse 9. It says, now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Now, you remember the story. It's told uh, in one of the other Gospels. <clears throat> but Mary is there at the tomb, and she is weeping. And the body of the Lord is not there. And she's there on his resurrection morning. But, you know, all those people, they did not grasp what the Lord had repeatedly told them that he would rise again the third day. That just didn't even register to them. And uh, so she's weeping, and um, and she hears a, a voice say, a woman, why weepest thou? And it says, and she, supposing him to be the gardener, said, if you've taken away the body of my Lord, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And, and then Jesus said, Mary. And she immediately knew. It was the Lord. Um, he was literally standing there in front of her. It was his first appearance after being in a grave. Uh, look at verse 12 of this chapter. Mark 16, 12. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. Look at verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief. They're sitting there. They're weeping. They're in that room for fear of the Jews. And the doors being shut, he appears. He didn't open the door. He didn't knock. Suddenly, he was there. And he was visible. And you could touch him. And he could eat. He told Thomas, you know, Touch me. Behold my hands and my feet. 
he appeared. The word appear applies something sudden. And you do not find that word used in any reference to everyday life in the, in the Gospels or in Acts. You know, there's nowhere where it has some other casual usage. It's almost always in reference to something unusual, something dramatic, and something totally unexpected. For example, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, an angel appears to Joseph in a dream. Herod inquired diligently what time the star, that one star, that unusual star, what time did that thing appear? On the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, it says, with the Lord Jesus, there appeared Moses. I don't who was the other person? Elijah. <laughs> I had a brain freeze there. <laughs> Moses and Elijah, they suddenly appeared. In Matthew 27, it says, after our Lord's resurrection, after his erection, it says many of the Old Testament saints appeared. Appeared. In Acts chapter 2, you have the day of Pentecost, and they're all in that upper room, and they're with one accord in one place, and uh, man, suddenly there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. And it says, and there appeared cloven tongues as a fire. And it said on each one of them. Ananias talks to Paul in Acts chapter 9. And he talks to him about Jesus that appeared unto him in the way. You know, that's, uh, you know, Saul was going on his way to Damascus, and a man, suddenly Jesus was in front of him. The use of that word is really consistent. Keep this commandment until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep it until suddenly, dramatically, unexpectedly, for the first time in your life and mine, whom having not seen we love, suddenly we will see him. We'll see him. And we will know who he is. You know, uh, Fanny Crosby said, we'll know who he is by the prints of the nails in his hand. And no doubt that is true. But if Nebuchadnezzar could recognize Jesus in the fire when he didn't even know there was a son of God, surely we will recognize him. We will surely know who he is. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, you have um, our Lord's last words to the disciples. And look at verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He went up into a cloud. He was visible. And they said, you're going to meet him in a cloud and he is going to be visible in like manner manner. And so this is the last thing these guys are told right before Jesus goes up. Now, what was their reaction to this? Um, uh, and you, you really, when in the book of Acts, when Luke tells the story, he slides right from this in incident into the, uh, the, the upper room and them waiting, you know, and the day of Pentecost comes. 
But there, this whole thing of what they had just heard created a reaction. They had just been told that this same Jesus that you have seen go away, he is coming back the same way he left in like manner. You will see him. You'll know who he is. And it's going to be about a cloud in the sky and he's coming back. Look at Luke 24. In Luke 24, Luke tells us something about the reaction that that created when they were told that. You know, Jesus had told them that he would go away. And, um, and you know, when he told them that, sadness had filled their heart. And uh, Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. And uh, so, you know, they they began to grasp that. And, um, and they were glad when they saw his resurrection. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And yet, and yet, uh, you know, it'd be a wonderful thing to see him risen. You'd know he's alive. But you know, there had to be some real mixed emotions at seeing the best friend you had ever had in your whole life. And, and that's the understatement, you know, of the year. I mean, what the Lord had done, what they had experienced was we read it and we think we understand, but we really don't understand what they had. I mean, we read a few chapters of what they did, but they walked and talked with him 24 seven for three and a half years. Uh, even the world itself could not contain the things that should be written. I mean, what they saw and what they experienced was unbelievable. And now they're watching him go. And the angel says, you know what you just saw? He's going to come back. He's going to come back just like he left. So what happens? Uh, Luke 24, verse 50. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. You know, they believed that he was going to come back. We haven't lost him. He's going to come back. And they were filled with joy and they worshipped him and they were on fire for God. Um, the thought was, can you imagine it through their lifetime? They thought suddenly at some point he will be visible to our eye again. You, you'd never forget what he looked like. And they thought, we're going to see him again. Look at 2 Timothy 4. He says, Timothy, I want you to keep this commandment until the appearing. Until the appearing. Well, it's funny the words our Lord used. And we love the King James Bible and we believe it is perfect. And, uh, and we believe that there is no mistake with the words that our Lord used. He could have used a different word. But he said, appearing, appearing. Look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing. Now, I, I want you to sort of remember that. We're going to revisit that thought later. But notice what he says. He says, uh, when I come back, there will there will be a time of judgment. But notice what he says. He will judge the quick, that's the living and the dead, at his appearing. Now, this is the last chapter, and Paul writes to Timothy, and Paul is about to lose his head as he writes these words. Verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up a crown of righteousness. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. The day of his appearing. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. 
Look at Titus. Just turn a page in your Bible. Maybe it's two pages. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus 2. Lay hold on eternal life. The for you know what we're all hoping. We're all hoping. We're all hoping we will beat death. We were. We're all hoping here tonight that um, you know we're saved. We already have eternal life. You know we sort of think that that we have to die to begin eternal life. And the fact of the matter is, we've already got it. Uh, we we have already passed from death into life, and we're still in this body. But man, that seed of immortality is in us and Christ in you and we our eternal life literally has already begun but we haven't we haven't stepped into the other side yet we haven't seen the glory of it we haven't seen the beauty of it um look at Titus 2 verse 13 now familiar verse many of you could quote it looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, uh, we're all hoping we beat death. And if we do, if we do, our, our, our launching into eternal life will begin with the sudden appearing. I mean, suddenly, you know, we'll, we'll hear a trumpet and we will we will see him. And man, from there on in, we're, we're, we're in a whole new world from there on. It begins with his appearing. Now, I have a question. Um, look at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Did God's grace bring you salvation? If you're in this room tonight and you're saved, this is not a trick question. Um, you know, how many of you would, did God's grace bring you salvation? Absolutely. That grace has appeared to you and you and you and you and you and you and you. I mean, you might not know everything about God's grace, and I'm sure we don't. But his grace appeared to us. And you know, this morning we talked about God being our father and a father teaches. For by grace are ye saved. And his grace teaches us some things. Look at um, look at verse 11 again. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Um, the grace that has appeared to us it teaches us how to live in this present world. Now, I want you to notice verse 12. Look at the second word, teaching us. All right. So I think we can safely say without doing violence to the scripture, that is that us is the reader at any given time through history. God's grace saved you. God's grace reached you. I mean, it was revealed to you. You embraced it. It brought you salvation. And it teaches you and me just like it did for the last 2,000 years. It teaches us how to live in this present world. But verse 12 doesn't end with the period. It teaches us, the reader at any given time in history, it teaches us how to live in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. You know what? You know what? God, God wants to teach us to live looking, actively looking for that moment when suddenly we will see him with our eyes. Look at Hebrews 9. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. He said, Timothy, I want you to keep this commandment. He said, I want you to fight that good fight. Lay hold on eternal life until 
the appearing. Hebrews 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sin of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So look back with me at 1 Timothy 6 for just a moment. Look at verse 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if his appearing was not in view in this verse, if, if, if that really wasn't in view, if it wasn't something that Timothy should have been looking for, it would be worded different. Per perhaps it would say this, that thou keep this commandment until you sleep in Jesus. That'd be, that'd be reasonable. Because Timothy's not going to live forever. Look at some verses with me. Look at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Here's Stephen. He's being stoned to death for Jesus Christ. Acts 7, 59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. Stephen was the, was the one calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now watch. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell Asleep. You know, in the Old Testament, there was no anticipation of any special event, uh, of, you know, of anything outside of death. Um, you know, it didn't matter how long you lived. You knew you were going to die. Genesis 5, uh, that's the chapter, the first natural death in the Bible appears in Genesis chapter 5. And man, that whole chapter is full of and he died and he died and he died. And some of those guys lived forever, but they still died. Um, in 1 Kings 2, David says, well, the scripture says in verse 1 that the time came near for David to die. And he said, I go the way of all the earth. In 1 Samuel 26, there was one of those events where, you know, David had been hunted by Saul and David was literally on the run for several years from Saul. And there was a few occasions where David had a chance to kill Saul. And one of those occurs in 1 Samuel 26. And David said, he said, I don't, he said, I'm not going to touch him. He said, I'm going to let the Lord handle this. And he said, he will descend into battle or his day will come to die. There was no anticipation for the Old Testament saint of any special event at death. The only thing they had to look forward to was, you know, they could live and live and live and maybe live a long time and maybe even be like Moses, you know, or, or some of those guys that were in good health right up till the last day and they were done. So look at 1 Timothy 6 again. Verse 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God. Verse 14, that thou, that's you, Timothy, keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say, Timothy, now you tell all them saints that are going to live down through the ages that they keep this commandment without spot until the appearing of our Lord. No, he said, Timothy, he said, you keep it. How long, Paul? Until the appearing. Timothy was told to be watching 
for an amazing, dramatic, sudden appearance of Jesus Christ. Look at uh, look at a couple verses with me. Look at First Thessalonians one. And part of my purpose tonight is, as we look at these verses, is um, I just want you to see, and, and it falls right in our text. You know, we're in First Timothy 6, and uh, Paul gives Timothy some very, very intense instruction. He says, I charge thee. He says, you keep this commandment without spot. There's something really important about this commandment. And he says, I want you to keep this until the appearance. I want you to see that uh, what I'm going to tell you tonight, and, and not that it's anything new, but I want you to see that I'm not stretching anything, and it's really in the Bible. That's really what I want you to see. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 8. For from you, you Thessalonians, sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith to God were to spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. For they, all the people that have heard you, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God. He said, he said, everybody knows that what we did with you Thessalonians changed your lives completely. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven, which delivered us from the wrath to come whom we raised from the dead. Um, First Corinthians one, verse seven, you don't have to turn there, but in the opening words to the church of Corinth, Paul said, he said, ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you if you say, well, you know, that was just them, and uh, they were, you know, they were deceived and they misunderstood. Do you, do you realize what you're saying when you say that? You're saying that the Lord purposely let them live under a false impression. That's what you're saying. In James five, Paul writes, "The husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth." and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, James says. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. You know, the, we, we talk about the early church and we would all sing the praises of the early church. We really would. I mean, if you have, if you have any sense at all, you would say, man, th that was the great days of the, the greatest days of the, of the church. And, um, and do you know one of their, uh, one of the things that governed their vision was they were looking for something. They were looking for something. They were looking for our Lord to return. Now, what happens is in the day and age which we live, and I don't want you to misunderstand me. Um, um, I know not everybody agrees on this, and that's okay. That's okay. It's one thing to disagree, but it's another thing when that doctrine is hated and mocked and despised, especially when there is a volume of scripture that speaks about it. I want to give you some quotes by a few guys. Um, one guy, he rejects the doctrine of Christ's 
He can come any day, return. He rejects that. And he calls it a weird little form of fundamentalism. He said that whole sense of the rapture, which could occur at any moment, he said it's used as a device to oppose engagement with the principalities, powers, and the political and economic stru structures of our age. What he just said was that all you guys believe in the rapture because you're trying to escape your spiritual responsibility to do something about the powers of evil and the political powers that be. Now, let me tell you about the guy that made the statement. He also said opposition to women preachers is evidence of demonic influence. In other words, if you're against women preachers, you're full of the devil. There's another guy. All these are big name guys, and uh, and they're they're not they're not evangelicals, okay? And you know what? You have you have to stop and think about that. Brian McLaren mocks the fundamentalist expectations of a literal second coming of Christ with the judgment that will come on. And he says, this world will go on like it is for hundreds of thousands of years. He calls that belief that Christ could come at any time. He calls it pop evangelical doctrine. And he calls it a doctrine of abandonment. In other words, it's just a bunch of people that want to escape all the responsibility. He says, the book of Revelation is not a book about the distant future but it's talking about the challenges of the immediate present. Now, how you would ever get that from the book of Revelation, you'd have to be reading a really different version. Here's another one of those guys. He mocks the idea of a rapture. He mocks the idea of a rapture for believers and the one world government with an antichrist who makes people get a mark and all that stuff. He said this kind of end time doctrine is not a message from Jesus, but one concocted by a cunning serpent. I, I We just read a whole bunch of verses about it. I, I, don't, I didn't hear a serpent's hiss. He said this guy mocks the, the rapture that could occur at any time. And he says that the rapture doctrine is an evidence of the sickness of American Christians. He calls us nutty Christian end time prophecy Kaczynski's. You know who Kaczynski was? Kaczynski was the Unabomber terrorist who murdered three people and maimed 23 others in his 18 year long crusade of sending bombs to people. He said, if you believe in the rapture, that's who you are. I just, I just think you need to think about this. Another one. He rejected the doctrine of a rapture that could occur, and occur at any time. And he moved to his current position that the kingdom of God is here and now. In other words, there's no literal kingdom coming. So with all that said, I want you to look at Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. Now, here's what will happen if you if you uh, if you look up some of these guys and no, just to be fair to you, I just want you to understand the guys I just quoted with uh, with not there. They are uh, Tony Campolo, Brian McLaren, Mark Driscoll and Dan Kimball, probably names most of you don't even know. They are not in the evangelical camp. But what concerns me is the guys that are in our camp that feel the same way. That mock us. I just, I just get this distinct feeling that they're all hooked up to the wrong spirit. Birds of a feather walk together. And they mock us. They mock us because we believe that we should live like the early church did. And you go on to some of their websites, and here's, here's the problem. Somebody will say, oh, they use tons of Scripture. Do they? And some of them do. 
So I got you in Isaiah 66. Would you mind, uh, before we go there, look at 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. You see, it all pastor. They got tons of scripture. And the answer to that is, some of them do. Some of them do. But you have to think about that a minute. I, I was just, uh, I'm going to read 2 Peter 3 here in a minute. Um, I was just, um, I was just on a website the other day and um, doing some research. And um, this guy st starts talking about, you know, tribulation. And he says, he says, um, you know, that. We must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of references that talk to uh, tribulation work of patience and all that. And you know what this guy does? In this article, he takes every single one of those references, and he says that's the tribulation period. And he says, you know, that that's all tribulation period. So all of a sudden, he's boxed himself into a corner because of his ridiculous reason. And he'll give you a whole list of references on, on tribulation. But here's the problem. None of those guys lived through tribulation. Tribulation, the word tribulation, it's very evident when it's referring to what's going on in Matthew 24 or whether it's re referring to the troubles and trials that we have in our day-to-day -day life. But some people can't make that difference. So all they do is they get a pile of verses that uses that word. They make no distinction. There's no discernment. And they throw it at you. And if you're naive, you go, oh, look at that. Well, look at, uh, look at 2 Peter 3, verse 15. Second Peter 3, verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. W-R-E-S-T, it's the same word as wrestle. It's, it's the thought of twisting, okay? Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. You know, uh, be careful just because somebody uses a pile of scripture. If you've ever uh, done any reading um, by any of the, uh, the cult groups, if you've done any reading at all, um, there are people that will produce all sorts of scriptures for all sorts of things. Um, but twisted scripture equals no scripture. If they've twisted it, scrap it. Um, look at Isaiah 66. They mock us for believing that Jesus could come at any time. Now, you know, we're big boys. And we put on our big boy britches. And you know what? It doesn't hurt our feelings a bit. You know what? There's a bunch of us. We're used to being made fun of. We're used to being called names. We're used to being ostracized. That's just life. Okay. But be that as it may, look what the Lord said in Isaiah 66. Verse 5. Again, keep in mind all these guys that mock us for our belief about the rapture of the church. Isaiah 66, 5. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified. That he shall appear to your joy. And they shall be ashamed. You know, he said, the Lord said, you know, there's a day coming. And he said, "It, you know, it's some of your brethren. And and the word hate is is very accurate word. I uh, I don't understand. I, I literally do not understand. I do not understand. 
but there's, there's some of these guys out there and, um, and it's not just about this. It, it could be about other doctrines. Uh, it, it's one thing to disagree. It's another thing to relegate everybody that disagrees with you as if they're heretics and they're going to hell and, and they're, they're brain dead and, 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 uh, and they just, just have nothing good to say. And they go on these big, long, verbose tirades against everybody that disagrees with them. And um, I had a friend of mine, actually I've had several, that have, uh, that have watched some of these guys online. I don't, I confess, I have not. And, uh, and, and, and this is what they will tell me. I had one person say, so I, I watched one of these dudes and say, I was shaking after a few minutes. They said, I have not heard so much hatred spewed out of a preacher in my life. Your brethren, they hated you. They cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord, they said, that, man, they're just, they, they think they're doing God's work. They thought they did it for the Lord. But the Lord said, I will appear. I will appear. And they, they shall be ashamed. Look at 1 Timothy 6 again. First Timothy 6, verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch the next phrase, which in his times he shall show. In his times he shall show. That's an interesting phrase. But he says, in his times. Of course, this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, um, man, the, the Lord, there's... There's times about him. There's there's points in time that really um, are amazing about our Lord. Of course, this is talking in this passage about something future, which in his times he shall show. Um, but of course, you know that um, Galatians 4 verse 4, but when the fullness of the times was come, uh, God sent forth his son, made of woman, made under the law. And, you know, that was his first coming, when the fullness of the time was coming. Um, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and uh, his name shall be called Emmanuel. You know, it was time. It was time. What a time it was. It was his time. But, man, he has more times coming. Look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And of course, we're talking about the Lord's coming. So we're just going to sort of uh, just hit this and move on. Matthew 24. um, Verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So there is there is a time, there is a time of that day and hour. You know, there were some people that that um, they they believe that. Um, you know, that when the, the last person got saved and when the, you know, the Lord was waiting for that last one and, and there probably will be a last one that gets saved. But but this sure looks like there is a day and an hour on God's calendar. Um, it's a definite time. Look at Acts chapter three, Acts chapter three.
Peter is preaching here in Acts chapter 3. And um, look at verse 19. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. In these verses, he talks about uh, two different things. He talks about the times of refreshing, and he talks about the times of restitution of all things. And of course, Jesus Christ is wedged right in the middle in verse 20. Man, there is a time of restitution of all things. God is going to restore everything. You know, everything began on earth with the garden. And it was a paradise. It was just, it was beautiful. Uh, and, you know, we don't have a clue. If you can imagine how beautiful the earth is. And, and some of you guys and some of you ladies, you have seen some beautiful places. And this is a sin-cursed earth. And, um, but... It started with the paradise, and it's going to be restored. There will be the time of restitution of all things. There will be another time. Look at Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw, verse 19, and I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. A lake of fire burning with brimstone. You know, there is a time of war and a time of victory coming. It says our Lord is a man of war. And um, uh, he's the Prince of Peace. But um, you come to the end and, uh, you know, everybody's going to gather together against him. And um, it says which in his times he shall show. And this is one of those times. It seems like there's several times coming where the Lord is going to be exalted, where he is going to shine where all heaven and earth is going to stand in awe of him and people are going to rejoice in that spirit world. And this is one of those times. There is a time coming of war and he's going to make war and he's going to be the victor and they're going to make war against him, but he's going to be the victor. Look at Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. Ephesians 1, verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, 
he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. This is another one of those times of our Lord. It's the fullness of times. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, boy, there's some times, sounds like some very long extended times, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. In his times, he will show. He's going to show himself, and he's going to show uh, two things. The the way that verse is worded, and we're going to close with this tonight. We're going to stop here. Look at verse 1 Timothy 6, verse 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show. And the question is, what is he talking about there? Which in his times he shall show. Well, man, there's a bunch of times and there's a few more that we're going to look at. But in his times, he's going to show something. And it can only be one of two things in that context. There's two things mentioned there. One is the keeping of that commandment to fight the good fight and to lay hold on eternal life. And the other thing that will be shown is Jesus Christ himself. And that shows up. In the verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And, you know, I think the answer is both of those are valid. In those times that are coming, you know, Jesus Christ is going to be all in all. He's going to be exalted. He's going to be glorified. We're going to rejoice in him. I love that song that we sing. Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. And, man, he's going to appear. We're going to see him. But he tells Timothy, Timothy, keep this commandment without spot. Lay hold on eternal life. Because in his times, everybody that did, it will be shown. It will be shown. It'll be Jesus Christ. And it'll be the people that followed him and laid hold on eternal life. And I want to leave that with you tonight. We're going to stop there. This has been more of a Bible study than anything else tonight. Um, Lay hold on eternal life until the appearing. Keep this commandment until the appearing. A man, when he appears, it's going to be the beginning of eternal life. You know, there was one of those famous guys of, of long ago and, and uh, his name was M.R. DeHaan, and he's, he's long dead now. And uh, he, wrote, uh, he wrote some books that became famous among Bible-believing Christians. He wrote a book. He was a medical doctor and who became a, a, a pastor and preacher. And, and he wrote a book called uh, The Chemistry of the Blood, and that probably is his single most famous book. It was a book from a medical doctor's perspective about uh, blood. But, of course, throughout the book, he ties in the thought of the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, but one of the things he, um, he was famous for was he often preached about our Lord's appearing, about our Lord's appearing. And he had a plaque on his desk that said, maybe today, maybe today. On his tombstone are etched two words, maybe today, maybe today. He said, Timothy, he said, you keep this commandment until the appearing. There's going to be one day, and you know what? You say, what do you do? One guy said this, you know, if I I knew that I was going to die tomorrow or if I knew that the Lord was coming tomorrow, whatever, he said, I'd still go to work. He said, I'd still do the things I always do. And you think, man, that sounds a little unspiritual, and yet it's not if, whether therefore you eat, or drink, 
or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Man, if we're if we're looking for His appearing, uh, we're conscious that eternity is not far away. But it could be that one day you'll get up. It'll be just like any other day. Maybe be tonight. It'll be a glorious day. It would end all our fears. It would take over care of all our worries. Uh, it would take care of all our financial dilemmas. It would take care of all our health problems. Uh, it would take care of all your marital problems. Because suddenly, everybody would be right with God and everybody would love as he loves because the moment, the moment he appears, that moment, you know what's going to happen? The songwriter said, this robe of flesh I'll drop and rise and seize the everlasting prize. You know what my greatest enemy is? My greatest enemy is the guy that I shaved this morning. Is the devil my enemy? He is. He is. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers. We do. But you know what? Even if there were no devil, and I think he's huge. I think he does zero in on us. I think we are continually at battle with the spirit world. They're always planting thoughts in our head. They're always twisting. They're always attacking our body and our moods and our glands. And, and they're throwing obstacles. And they're causing people to say stupid stuff. And they're causing us to. It just never ends. But you know, if tomorrow morning you got up and the devil was far away, you still have you. And I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary the one to the other. But when he appears, when that trumpet sounds, And suddenly, we are forever with the Lord in that moment. I think one of the greatest blessings of that moment is all the battles with me are done. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to react. And I don't have to worry about what I'm going to say. And I don't have to worry about what I'm not going to feel like doing for the Lord. And I know I should do it anyway. I'm not going to have to worry about all it because all of a sudden, that dark side of me that I inherited from Adam, I will be forever separated from him. Did you ever wonder what, what it would be like to never ever be able to have an evil thought again? I can't imagine. I have them all the time. I know you guys don't, but I have them all the time. I had a dream one time, a good dream. I don't have very many good dreams. I have a lot of crazy dreams is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I have a lot of crazy dreams. But I don't have too many good ones. Okay. But I've had a few good ones. And this one of the sweetest dreams I ever had in my whole life. I walked outside of this house. And it was our old house that we lived in in Pennsylvania. And, and, and it was an old farmhouse. And, and, um, and it was evening. And I, I stepped out the door and I stepped onto the concrete sidewalk and suddenly something happened. And I felt like in my dream, I've seldom had a feeling so real ever in a dream. I felt like I was being sucked out of my body. And I thought, this is it. This is it. And I was like, and then I woke up. <laughs> Looking, the grace of God teaches us how to live in this present world. And it teaches us to look. Look forward to and to look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. The only sad side of all that is, and, and it's often voiced whenever we talk about this stuff, we, we all rejoice in that thought. The only sad side of this, people say, but I've still got some lost loved ones. And yes, amen, and we need to work while it's day. You know why? Because he's coming. He's coming. Maybe today. Let's pray.
Lord, you're appearing. Lord, you sure you sure mentioned it a lot. Lord, help us that in the midst of the craziness of the world that we live in, we will not lose that anticipation that one day and maybe very soon we will see you visibly with our eyes. Now, Lord, may we live in the light of that and may we lay hold of that because, Lord, when that day comes, this life is over and we step into eternal life. Lord, help us. We don't know how much time we have. But Lord, help us that we would live for you with all we have. And in the midst of all our anticipations and expectations and plans, Lord, may we not only remember, but may we look for your appearing. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if God has spoken to you tonight, why don't you talk to him? Lord, thank you that you love us, and thank you, Lord. We have a hope that the Old Testament saints did not have, and Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, we may not live to see it, perhaps, but Lord, our children may, and yet, God, we may all be gathered unto you shortly. Lord, thank you for this hope. It is a blessed hope, Lord, that we might not see death. Lord, 
Bless it to our hearts. May it be a thing of joy in our vision. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.